It's Wednesday, August 5th, and this is now on HNN. Vandals strike the state's labor department as thousands of frustrated people still wait for their unemployment benefits. You could call 500 times in two hours and never get through to anyone. This as renters being told to pay up or move out during the pandemic could get legal aid. Landlords should know that it is illegal to evict people. It's illegal to threaten eviction. A massive explosion devastates Beirut. I'm Ian Lee with a look at the aftermath and what it means for Lebanon. Months after an arsonist took aim at the Cohio Beach surfboard lockers, they're reopening, coming up on This Is Now. Seventy-three cases. We're in the biggest surge, uh, obviously, of the pandemic. The one hundred seventy-three cases really is a is a landmark because now we have as many active cases as we have cases that have already been, you know, cleared, and that's uh, you know that's a pretty astounding situation. That's Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green in a brand new interview with our H&M reporter Allison Blair. Moments ago, he's reacting to today's new numbers from the State Department of Health. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan alongside Ashley. Once again, we got a lot to, of news to get to today. That's right. As the LG mentioned, health officials are reporting 173 new COVID-19 cases today. We're told all patients are on Oahu, which is a record high for the island. Because of the surge in cases on Oahu, the city is holding more drive through testing this weekend. On Saturday, testing will take place at Geiger Community Park in Eva from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And on Sunday, tests will will be performed at Kaka'aka Waterfront Park from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Those who attend will be screened and doctors on site will determine who should be tested. Testing will be free for those without insurance. And take a look at this map from NBC News. It's tracking the hot spots around the country. You can see the state of Hawaii is orange, which isn't good. It says our case count has increased by 231 percent over the last two weeks. The only state with a higher surge is New Jersey. Meanwhile, while months into the pandemic, thousands of Hawaii workers still haven't received unemployment benefits. Casey Lund has more. Before we get into that, I wanted to show you what's happening here at the unemployment office and what we believe happened overnight and to direct your attention to this pipe that um, somehow flew through the window here at the unemployment office off of Punchbowl. Uh, you'll remember back in June, the office was also vandalized when someone damaged the front door to the building. Uh, we did reach out to the unemployment office about this latest incident. They say uh, they don't have any new information on this. The sheriff's office is investigating uh, no security footage in this area and they also still don't know who caused that damage back in June. But let's get to some of the issues with the unemployment office internally and with the PUA program. The PUA program, of course, uh, the program that provides benefits to those freelance and independent contract workers. The Department of Labor and Industrial Relations says the fraudulent claims have created a backlog, meaning many people who are eligible have not received support, in some cases months after applying. In order to apply for the PUA program, though, they first had to apply and get denied for regular unemployment insurance. Insurance. I filed for unemployment as soon as I could and dated it March 23rd. Now, originally, I could not get into the regular unemployment website um, because it was crashing all the time. And so it took me weeks and weeks and weeks of just hundreds of attempts a day just to get into the website. Of course, the phone lines rang. You could call 500 times in two hours and never get through to anyone. And that's Candace Kirby, who freelanced for an interior design company that hasn't been able to give her work. She's been waiting for assistance from the PUA program for almost 20 weeks. Wendy Hachi is in a similar situation, denied for regular unemployment, waited for PUA, then about a week ago received a letter saying that she may now actually qualify for regular unemployment after all. The biggest thing that bothers me, it seems like, is that I don't know if the two departments are talking to each other. Like, does, do they even know what's happening? Is the left hand talking to the right hand? Is, you know, I don't know what's happening there, which is very frustrating. And then you never get any responses back from emails. So it, I just, 
it's very frustrating. And, and I have a lot of girlfriends who are in the same position and, and it's hard. It's really hard. But the OIR says there are a number of reasons some poor applicants might not be eligible, even though they may think they are. Part of that is a federal requirement that makes the state look at eligibility on a quarterly basis, meaning that claimants who filed in March became eligible in April. The same thing happened at the beginning in July, according to the department. Still, there's really no denying that there have been some serious communication and support issues here at the unemployment office, specifically in the PUA program. Now, the DLIR has told us that they've begun recruiting about 30 new claims examiners. They say that when those people begin working here, the majority of them will be focusing on the PUA program, though they haven't given us a clear timeline of when that will happen. At the Unemployment Office, I'm Casey Lund for This Is Now. The mayor says short of closing everything down again, he doesn't know what more he can do to make people understand the severity of the pandemic. He says he's ready to take drastic action to protect public health and safety. We could also close parks altogether like we did in the early days of the pandemic. You know, we could go all the way back to shutting everything down, which we do not want to do. And I don't know what more to do to get people to understand how critically important it is. We take action. It's been four months now since an eviction moratorium took effect statewide. Despite that, some tenants say they're being told by their landlords, pay up or get out. Our Jolani Martinez has more on their story. Advocacy groups say more landlords are violating the emergency eviction ban that's been in effect since April due to rising unemployment. One tenant who asked to remain anonymous says his landlord threatened to kick him out if he didn't pay the full rent. After getting his work hours cut and making only partial rent payments for months, the tenant says Texas show the landlord told him to come up with the rent in a week or move out. With little income, he and his wife and child packed up to avoid eviction. Was it mid-June? that I started getting texts about moving out or get pay rent or got, I got to move out. Landlord should know that it is illegal to evict people. It's illegal to threaten eviction. Um, it's Ill illegal to lock tenants out of their properties. Uh, and, and more importantly, and just as importantly, there are significant legal consequences for doing that, uh, including uh, damages. One landlord we spoke with says property owners should work with renters to either arrange payment plans or find a solution, adding that landlords have to make a living too. To give everyone certainty, the advocates also want the government to extend the eviction moratorium through the end of the year. Tenants threatened with eviction are encouraged to call the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii at 536-4302. Jolani Martinez, Hawaii News Now. Leaders are debating whether the state has enough contact tracers. Health Director Bruce Anderson says right now the state has 107 tracers who can handle about 20 cases each. While Anderson says the department has things under control, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green says the state doesn't have enough capacity to trace everyone. Dr. Park is, uh, has been a, a champion of contact tracing. He's been overseeing this activity for since the beginning here. There is going to be a point if we can't get this thing under control where the contact tracing is simply not going to be as effective as it, it, it could be. But the Department of Health, uh, particularly Dr. Park, was really philosophically against a, an army of contact tracers. That was a mistake. And that mistake has to be corrected and I'm working to correct it. Some 450 people have trained through UH's contract tracing program, but only about 20 of those have been hired, and some didn't even get a chance to apply. DOH says it may hire more groups of tracers as needed. The state is also bringing in 10 National Guardsmen to help. The latest poll by Civil Beat and Hawaii News Now shows what voters think of the state's response to the pandemic, as well as the presidential race. Civil Beat's Chad Blair joined us this morning on Sunrise to discuss the results. We'll start with schools. Okay, 54% of those polled say that they're not satisfied with the plan to reopen the schools 
Was there anything in particular that they pointed to as a source of this dissatisfaction? Well, Steve, I'll give you one example. I interviewed a special education teacher who took our poll, and he says, boy, he misses his kids. He hasn't seen them in three months, but he knows that when they come back to school, they're going to start mingling directly with each other. They're going to throw caution to the wind. So this teacher, who's 60 years old, he says, look, I got a 91-year-old father-in-law. I've got an 80-year-old mother who's a cancer survivor. They depend on me. I run errands for them. What if the teacher gets sick? What if he becomes asymptomatic? So that I think in many ways encapsulates uh, the, the, the fear that a lot of people are worried about if schools come back together as they are scheduled to do on August the 17th. Yeah, uh, what's also interesting is tourism. 56% say they're not satisfied with the plan to reopen tourism. But at the same time, we all understand you know, the, the necessity of having that and, and the effect on the economy. So are they not satisfied with tourism coming back at all or the plan or, or what did you read into this? Well, I think most people recognize that we simply depend heavily on tourism and the tax revenue that comes in with that. I interviewed one person who's an accountant. He has several restaurants that he works for. He's their, you know, their accountant. He does the books and he says, look, you're missing a lot of general excise tax. You're missing a lot of hotel tax. How can you survive without that money? But the concern is, what if, as you know, more sick people start coming in? Is there a proper screening process that's in place to make sure that we control the virus? Yeah, the, what, what's also interesting, we, talk, we keep talking about a possible lockdown, that that could possibly happen again a second time around. And so I guess this, this next bit of data is, is extra interesting, that there seems to be overwhelming support for the stay-at-home orders that we just had, right? Well, you heard Mayor Caldwell so, say yesterday he doesn't want to go back to that complete lockdown, but it does sound like it's on the table. Well, we heard from the people that we polled overwhelmingly, you indicated 56 percent, you know, the quarantine worked, specifically the 14-day quarantine for arrivals uh, from uh, the mainland and, and abroad. And as well, they felt that those stay-at-home orders, which have changed, have evolved over the summer, generally were effective too, because up until now, we have seen those caseload numbers uh, stay pretty steady. Of course, everything's changed in the last couple of days with these alarming triple-digit figures, but overall, people seem to be willing to maybe crack down a little bit longer. Yeah, I just want to make sure we got the, the right numbers. 75% say that the uh, stay-at-home and quarantine orders were effective. Oh, thank you. Good yeah. catch on that, Steve. Yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> one more thing. Uh, presidential race, um, anything shock you there? No, absolutely not. The numbers are nearly identical to Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump uh, four years ago. About. About two-thirds, not quite, are going to vote for Joe Biden. About 30 percent uh, favor Donald Trump. I don't think there's going to be any dramatic change in the Biden versus Trump race here locally. Yeah, I want to go back to the schools because I thought this was really interesting. Just by talking to a, a couple of parents and talking to people from other schools, as much as there may be a, a little bit of pushback as far as getting the, the students back into the schools, it seems like there are a lot of parents and the overwhelming majority at this point that still have their students, their their children enrolled for this next upcoming semester, doesn't it, Chad? They do, and remember that Hawaii doesn't really have a good pre-K or child care system in place. It's expensive to do child care, and people have been having their kids at home since, as you know, May when the schools let out. So uh, the people are moving forward to get their kids into school, but that doesn't dismiss or diminish how concerned a lot of people are about what's going to happen with COVID-19 in the schools. Yeah, great data, even better perspective on it. Chad Blair, thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Steve. Major cruise lines like Carnival and Royal Caribbean are suspending service through the end of October. It's an industry-wide decision. Carnival guests are being offered an enhanced value package of a future cruise credit or a full refund. If conditions in the U.S. change and short modified sailings are possible, the industry may consider an earlier restart. Southwest Airlines is cutting back on cabin cleaning procedures that were instituted because of the pandemic. The air carrier rolled out the enhanced cleaning program back in March. Scaling it back will mean changes, including no longer sanitizing seat belts between flights. The company says cleanings will now focus on a few items like tray tables and lavatories. According to a memo sent to flight attendants, the move will reduce the time planes spend on the ground between flights. Deep overnight cleanings will continue Southwest says it will limit plane capacity through the end of October to allow for middle seats to remain empty. More than 100 people are dead and nearly 4,000 are injured after that massive explosion rocked Beirut. Many are still missing. Ian Lee brings us the very latest developments. The explosion was caught from different angles. 
But the devastation is everywhere. Glass and blood paved the streets of Beirut. Many of the city's residents turned into the walking wounded. Local hospitals already struggling with COVID cases filled up quickly. Doctors and nurses were forced to treat many in the street. I felt something like lightning striking across Beirut, this shop owner says. Then everything turned red and the force of the explosion threw me. The morning light revealed more of the destruction and desolation. Ground zero is smoldering, hundreds are still missing. The explosion was so massive it was felt in neighboring countries. It's believed roughly 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate used in fertilizer and bombs was responsible for the accidental blast. The explosive material had been stored for years at a portside warehouse. Lebanon's prime minister asked for international help while vowing a thorough investigation. What happened today won't pass without accountability, he says. Those responsible will pay the price for what happened. At the White House, President Trump offered his deepest sympathies. Our prayers go out to all the victims and their families. The United States stands ready to assist Lebanon. The country will need all the help it can get. Already facing surging coronavirus cases, political unrest and a severe economic crisis. Now Lebanon mourns its latest disaster. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. Let's stay on this story for a moment. We got some more dramatic video to show you. And for our podcast listeners, I'll do my best to describe it. So here we see a beautiful scene in Beirut on Tuesday. You see a beautiful bride there. This video doesn't even capture the joy of her wedding day. It captures the terrifying moments of the massive explosion. Watch as the impact of the blast blows her back. You can see her dress. Her veil just blowing in the force of that impact. The photographer keeps rolling as he gets pushed back and that shockwave rips through the streets. You can see people running for safety, including the bride and groom. The photographer called this all a nightmare. We're going to stay on top of this story and bring you any latest updates we get as they come in. The case against Chad Daybell is heading to trial. The bodies of two children were found on his Idaho property. The children belonged to his wife, Lori Vallow. They were married on Kauai weeks after her kids were last seen. Two days of preliminary hearings for Daybell's case were held in an Idaho court and disturbing evidence came out, including that seven-year-old J.J. Vallow's body was duct taped and still in pajamas. Tylee Ryan was a teenager and detectives say her remains were found in a partially burned mass. Daybell is accused of concealing the evidence of the children's deaths. Vallo is set to appear in court next week. You'll recall this scene in February. A fire swept through surfboard racks at Cohio Beach. Now the repairs are finally done and Billy V is in Waikiki with the update. Thank you very much. Down here in Waikiki, uh, there's a lot of smiling faces because the racks are back, but they're not ready just yet. If you remember, February 27th, earlier this year, two alarm fire here in this spot took out about 500 surfboards and all of the racks that were here. Uh, devastation and damage to a lot of the surfers because those boards were like best friends or family members. Some of those boards out of the 60s or 70s and the stored by people that not only local residents but people from literally all around the world that come here to surf. So they've been without the racks to put their surfboards and today we talked to a lot of them they're very, very happy. Now, not all the racks are open today. Rows A and B are shut down only because they're still doing some work and they're doing some repairs. You can see the damage from the fire is still apparent on the side of the Moana Surf Rider. But they are right now putting the finishing touches on these racks and the surfers will be happy. Just note that if you had a uh, locker or a surf rack from before and you are affected by the fire, go to the city and county's website because you'll be able to not get your exact same locker and rack back but they'll be in you'll be able to be in here and you won't have to pay until the end of the year december 31st uh, if you're new you'll have to wait in line more information on our website at hawaiinewsnow.com from waikiki beach i am billy v for this is now thank you very much billy for that report and what a beautiful day to be out there in any surf that there is it's right now 85 degrees let's get a check of your forecast with guy hoggy <laughs> 
how's it on this Wednesday? We have increasing showers expected into those windward areas. Upstream moisture will increase tonight through tomorrow. We'll get more scattered showers, but for today, not so much. We do have a few light splashes and it's not totally dry, but for the most part, we're not seeing a whole lot of rain just yet. And those winds, well, they'll, they'll be running at surplus speeds. 15 to 25 from Kauai all the way to Maui. Lighter winds, of course, over in Kona. They'll be hot and steamy there with some afternoon clouds and some afternoon showers. Otherwise, we're in for the best weather on the planet. But watch for increasing showers tonight for those windward and Maui areas. However, rainfall totals will be light to moderate over the next 24 hours. And then as we head into the weekend, we'll see fewer showers. In fact, the weekend is looking quite nice, although it's going to be a little windy. We'll have more news on air and online, so stay tuned. We've got several stories to talk about from the feeds today. Let's start with Google. Here, let me show you this, guys. So this is Google's homepage today. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. The search giant is using its popular Google Doodle to promote mask wearing Cute. and social distancing. You can see the letters they're animating and sort of playfully separating themselves. The letters then, well, the letter E then sends a heart emoji in the air depicting he's an adherence to CDC guidelines, of course. You know, um, this when you click on this, it actually takes you to more safety tips, so if you're interested in that. For me, though, I honestly, I love Google Doodles, but I never go to the Google homepage. I just search in the, right. the toolbar. So. But if I know there's something cool, I'll go check it out. Yeah, the artists are really great. Yeah, and this is what I found. Instagram's copycat version of TikTok is now available in the U.S. and more than 50 other countries. Now, the short form video feature is called Reels and it was launched today. Like TikTok, Reels lets Instagram users make 15 second videos set to music or audio, including special effects. It comes amid uncertainty about TikTok's future in the U.S. Recent days have seen threats from President Trump to ban TikTok, as well as discussions about a potential U.S. takeover of the app by Microsoft. And apparently a reboot of Who's the Boss is in the works. Tony Danza and Alyssa Milano confirmed the news on social media. The original sitcom ran on ABC from 1984 to 1992. It starred Danza as a single father who goes from being a professional baseball player to a live-in housekeeper. Reports say the show will be a sequel to the original, taking place 30 years later with Milano's character Samantha, now a single mother mother living in the house the original series was set in. So kind of like Full House, what yeah, they did. Totally. Yeah, totally. that with so many shows. Yeah, so no network has been announced yet for the new show, but we'll wait and see. I got no Tony Danza impression for you. <laughs> Not even going to do it. Thank goodness. And meanwhile, a new Hawaii play will take to the virtual stage. Jim Mendoza shows us how Kumu Kahua Theater's latest production will be performed on Zoom. Look how they cover their bodies so. Awe! This rehearsal of Kubu Kahua Theater's The Conversion of Ka'ahumanu was done on Zoom. This is also how the play will look when it's performed live on the computer. You are going to be intimate with the actors. You're going to be this close to them. You're going to hear them well. You are going to be able to see them well. COVID's cut back on social gatherings forced the performance to the digital stage and the actors to perform from their homes. Kumu Kahua is a small theater. So the actors know that what they do with their faces and their eyes and their voices can communicate a lot. The cast has rehearsed since March when the play was supposed to premiere. We promise it is really going to be more than you expect we can do on a screen. Kubu Kahua was founded 50 years ago to tell Hawaii stories in different ways. This one is really different. Working with this new medium, I think is an honor to that idea of experimentality and seeing how that experiment can still communicate our stories. The conversion of Ka'ahumanu will be performed on August 8th and 9th. It's being offered for free. We are hoping that people will donate when they see the show because we need to keep this place alive <laughs> uh, until we can open the theater again. I wish to try such clothes. You will make one for me. For more information on the show, go to kumukahua.org. Jim Mendoza, Hawaii News Now. And that's going to do it for This Is Now. We'll be back tomorrow, guys. Stay safe out there.